Good morning. I was here a few weeks ago. It's good to hear Aubrey so relaxed. There's a little bit more stress the last time I was here. Good to see all of you here. Church hasn't emptied. For those who were here, I didn't get any invitations for coffee afterwards, so I think everyone survived. We've got 18 ladies preaching across the south this morning. It's wonderful. 18 ladies and me. I'm not sure what to make of that exactly. But when Grant gets back, I'll be sure to ask him an explanation. Yeah, so this morning is a free topic, and um, gave it some thought. The one, the one book I don't think I've ever heard a series on is the book of Leviticus. It's probably fairly obvious why I've heard Leviticus described in various ways. Probably the funniest uh, description of the book of Leviticus is it's a little bit like puberty. You go through it once, strange and confusing things happen, and you don't want to talk about it. It's not bedtime reading. My old man described the book of Leviticus to me as the most effective sleeping tablet. If you're struggling to sleep, he opens the book of Leviticus. He never made it past chapter one, such as the book of Leviticus. But I've picked it this morning for a couple of reasons. I believe there's some stuff in there that's really important for us. Uh, but it's also just to demonstrate this thing, that the word of God is the word of God. And it doesn't matter which part of it. There might be some parts of the word of God that are more easily digestible than others. But actually, when we, when we take the time to study scripture, to understand what was being said within that context and its application to us today. There's actually some incredible blessings that come out of it. And so, so I've picked the book of Leviticus partly for that reason. And there's a couple others that we'll come up with, some points that we'll come up with along the way. But there's three things in particular that I want to have a look at. The first one is the Sabbath. The second one is the year of Jubilee. And the third one is the Day of Atonement. And, and these are words we don't even use today. And they're not in our general vocabulary, let alone, I think, an understanding of what they actually were and the significance that they have today. And we fall into a trap and we think, well, that was Old Testament, had significance to them, but we've moved on from them. No, we haven't. What we have today in Christ has been built on those things. And the more that we understand them, the, the richer our faith and our understanding of the New Testament is today. And so when we look at the law, which is really what the whole of Leviticus is about, it's about living in a relationship with God, it's about living in a relationship with man, and it's about living in a relationship with the land, physical land, the promised land that they inherited. It doesn't make for good reading, but there's a whole bunch of other areas in our lives too where you know, if you've ever gone through your learner's manual when you did your drivers, you know, that doesn't make for riveting reading either. But if you want to drive and survive, you need to understand the law of the road. It, the, the building code doesn't make for riveting reading either. But if you want to build and survive without the house collapsing, you need to understand, or at least the builder needs to understand, the building code and the constitution and the law in general. If you want to live in the land, you need to understand the law. And so what was this all about? It was all about living in the presence of a holy God. If you want to survive, this is how you do it. This was an agreement between a holy, all-powerful, sovereign God and an unholy people. We don't get to start dictating the terms and conditions. God does. You either accept it or you don't. But it was really important that you understood what it meant to live in the presence of a holy God because people died when they transgressed. So we're going to have a look at three there's three chunks of scripture here. Leviticus. It's be a bit of work, but it'll be worth it. Stick with me. I'm going to look at these three things, explain what they meant in their context, and then we're going to take all three of them into the New Testament and have a look at what they mean in the New Testament and their significance to us today. So Leviticus chapter 25. The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. This is just before they're going into the promised land. Saying, speak to the people of Israel... And say to them, when you come into the land that I give you, you shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall reap your vineyards and gather in its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your, in your harvest or gather the grapes of your undressed vines. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. The Sabbath of the land shall provide food for you, for yourselves, for your male and female slaves, and for your hard worker and the sojourner who lives with you, and for your cattle and for the wild animals that are in your field. All its yield shall be for your food. And that's a fairly simple thing to understand. There were six years you could work your land, get a crop. In the seventh year, you didn't work it, but you could gather food in, in the fields and all of that for you, your slaves, your livestock. The year of Jubilee. This is a little bit later on. You shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years 
shall give you 49 years. That sounds really confusing, but it's quite simple. Seven Sabbaths, seven years, seven years, seven years, the 49th year. That was the year of Jubilee. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the 10th day of the seventh month. Remember that day. 10th day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout your land. And you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. When each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself, nor gather the grapes from the undressed vines. For it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You may eat the produce of the field. In this year of jubilee, each of you shall return to his property. And if you make a sale to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one, one another. You shall pay your neighbor according to the number of years after the jubilee, and he shall sell to you according to the number of years for crops. If the years are many, you shall increase the price, and if the years are few, you shall reduce the price, for it is the number of crops that he is selling to you. You shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear the Lord your God, for I am the Lord your God. Therefore, you shall do my statutes and keep my rules and perform them, and you will dwell in the land securely. The land will yield its fruit, and you will eat your fill and dwell in it securely. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year? If we may not sow or gather in our crop, I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year, so that you will produce a crop sufficient for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will be eating some of the old crop. You shall eat the old until the ninth year when its crop arrives. Again, I think fairly self-explanatory. Every 49th year, seven batches of seven years. It was a jubilee in which you gathered nothing. You stored in the 48th year, and that saw you over till the 51st year when that next crop came out. That's quite a big leap of faith. Included in this was a redemption of property. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. You are strangers and sojourners with me, and in all the country you possess, you shall allow a redemption of the land. If your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. If a man has no one to redeem it, but himself becomes prosperous and finds sufficient means to redeem it, let him calculate the years since he sold it and pay back the balance to the man to whom he sold it and then return to his property. But if he does not have sufficient means to recover it, then what he sold shall remain in the hand of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. In the Jubilee, it shall be released and he shall return to his property. So what happened there? You got two farmers. One, whether it was through his own fault, negligence, laziness, bad decisions, or whether it was just purely misfortune. Sometimes things happen that are beyond our control in life. Poor health, inability to, to be able to sow, drought, whatever. One farmer, unable to continue his operations, basically bankrupt. He sells his land to the farmer next door. On the year of Jubilee, the 50th year, the land would be returned to him. But what wouldn't be returned is the produce of the land. The livestock, the implements, whatever was produced on the land, he had no share in it, no profit in it. It all got taken off the land when the, when the lease came to an end, this year of Jubilee. And then lastly, the last big chunk, are you with me? Leviticus chapter 16, probably the pinnacle of the Old Testament and certainly one of the pinnacles within the scripture. This is the Day of Atonement. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord to use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, and the tent of meeting, and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities in itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat free in the wilderness." Scapegoat was an incredible thing. I'm just going to give you some of the context and some of the understanding you get out of commentaries. The scapegoat, what would happen with a scapegoat? They would place, as it said, all their iniquities, all their sins on this thing, a, a ritual that they would perform, and then a fit man 
would be chosen. And while the whole assembly of Israel stood outside the tent of meeting, after it had been made holy once again through these sacrifices, this fit man would walk with that goat until he was out of their sight. And commentary says as far as 15 kilometers. It wasn't like the Midlands, you go over the hill and you're out of sight. I think it was a lot flatter, 15 kilometers. Then he would stop, he would release the goat, and he would watch the goat continue walking until it was out of his sight. And then he would return to the people and he would say, the goat that I led out of your sight, I watched until it was out of my sight. That's how far our iniquities have been taken. Far, far out of sight. The priest, the high priest was the one that performed all of these ceremonies. And he did everything himself. There, there was obviously there were a bunch of priests. There were guys that used to light the candles, uh, prepare the incense, burn it, prepare the fires, prepare the animals, store to the animals. But on this day, the Day of Atonement, the high priest was responsible for absolutely everything. There was nobody else in the tent of meeting, nobody else near the altar. Everybody else stood outside the tent of meeting at a distance and they watched on. It was so strenuous that the high priest used to come in two weeks before the day of atonement to start preparing himself. In all of his duties was the slaughter of 15 animals, including a couple of bulls. Now, I don't know exactly what the process is from getting the bull from the field to dead on the altar, but I imagine that at some point that animal becomes very uncooperative. And one man versus a bull must be quite a fight. Fifteen animals, part of his duties for the day. And he did all of that work by himself. Nobody was allowed to help him. He collected the firewood, he brought it in, slaughtered the animals, absolutely everything. Incredibly strenuous job. The other significant thing is he did all of this in his undergarments, or what we would call today his jocks. On every other day of the year, the high priest was the most gloriously dressed man in all of Israel. Jewels, gold, fine linen. He had the most incredible clothing. He was the most spectacularly dressed man. And then on the singular most important day in their calendar, he performed his duties in his jocks in front of everyone. He was a humiliated priest. This is part of what I love about the wisdom of God. I look at that. I would never have dreamt that up myself. Human wisdom is on the most important day. He must look the most important, not the least important. Sabbath, the Jubilee, and atonement in the New Testament. What's the significance? What's this thread? And we've looked at it very briefly. You can follow this thread the whole way through into the New Testament. Every single one of these things easily turned into a series and we wouldn't get bored. I'm going to read three scriptures out of the New Testament for you. Matthew 1 verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. Now you and I read that and it doesn't really sound too significant. Matthew was writing to Jewish readers and for a Jewish person, this thing would have leapt out of the page and screamed at them. 14, 14, 14. Three 14s is the same as six sevens. If you're struggling with the maths, don't acknowledge it, but find someone gentle and loving later to explain. <laughs> Six sevens. The seventh seven. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. In reference to the Sabbath and seven sevens in, repre in reference to the year of Jubilee. The very start of the book of Matthew, that's how he starts it off. This is Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of the Sabbath and the fulfillment of of the year of Jubilee, explained through the generations. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. This is now in Jesus' ministry. And he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year 
of the Lord's favor. That is the Jubilee year. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the tendon and sat down. When they preached back then, they sat. They didn't stand like we do. So this is the preach. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. As far as nine word preachers go, that's got to be the most impactful in all of history. Nine word preach. That's all he said. This thing has been fulfilled in your hearing today. I am the fulfillment of the year of the Lord's favor. I am the Jubilee year. Everything that went with that. Everything laid down in the Old Testament concerning those things. And later, in Jesus' ministry and his death, the Day of Atonement, everything fulfilled in him. It's just the most intricately interwoven tapestry when you start to understand everything that God had been doing for centuries before in the lead up to this so that when it came to Christ, to his birth, his ministry, his resurrection, everything that he did, everything had been laid down. It was all laid out in the most intricate way, every detail, for people to say, this actually is what God was on about all the time. It's an incredible thing. It's what God was effectively doing in the Old Testament and it's, it's unfortunate that for you and I, for humanity, we always seem to subvert what God is doing. We, we always seem to miss his heart somehow. This is what the Sabbath was about. I don't know what you think about when you hear of Sabbath. I, I, I loathe the thought of being forced not to do anything for a whole day. Maybe it's me, but I think most of us. Now, all the rules and the laws that come along with it. But that was never God's heart. The heart of the Sabbath was this. It was God saying, I want to commune with you. I want to spend time with you. I want you to know who I am. I want you to study my word. Come into my presence. And I understand that you've got things that you have to do. You need to protect yourself. You need to provide for yourself. You have all these things to do. This is the promise that I'm making with you. You set aside one day to come and commune with me, and I will take care of your physical needs in the meantime. That was the promise. And throughout the whole of Scripture, and throughout the whole of humanity, and all of our lives, we somehow always miss the heart of what God is doing from Adam and Eve. Puts them in the Garden of Eden. He says, don't eat any of the fruit. Sorry, don't eat this fruit, but you can eat anything else. <laughs> the one fruit that they must eat is the one that they, they can't eat. And I just cannot imagine that God put them in the Garden of Eden with a, an apple tree and a banana tree. So you eat bananas the rest of your life. Don't touch the apple. I look at everything else, the diversity that God created. And I've got to believe that there must have been hundreds or thousands of fruit trees Every other type of thing was created in multiples of thousands, tens of thousands, and millions. Such was the diversity and the splendor of God's creation. And yet the one thing that God says, don't touch us, it's not good for you, they do it. We have learned nothing from Adam and Eve, because we do the same. Okay, so Jesus' time on the Sabbath had all been about work and not doing work. They'd fixated on this thing, they'd missed the point. And over and over again, Jesus did things on the Sabbath which irked the religious leaders. In fact, he seems to have sought out opportunities just to rile them. One particular day, on a Sabbath, there's a man with a withered hand. And the, the religious leaders just know Jesus is going to do something. So they're watching him. And he calls this man up and he says to them, Is it unlawful to do good on the Sabbath? And there's no answer. If your son or your ox fell into a ditch, would you leave it there on the Sabbath? Because it's the Sabbath. No answer. Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 14, read them both. No answer. He says to man, stretch out your hand. He stretches out and it's healed. And they want to kill him as a result. Because everything, they just missed the point completely. The Sabbath is this blessing from God to be able to come and commune with him while he takes care of the rest. And instead they're fixated on this we mustn't work. Jesus' disciples were walking through a field one Sabbath and they take some wheat and they grind it in their hands. It was deemed work. <laughs> the religious people got upset because they're working the grains in their hand. It was never about that. It was about coming into the presence of God, being able to put aside our duties to survive, be able to spend time with Him. That was the point of the Sabbath. In the New Testament, it's so much more than that. It's God providing for our needs emotionally, spiritually, at an eternal level. It's about a restoration of dignity, restoration of relationship. So much more in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 27, verse 
verse 24. This is the crucifixion of Jesus. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. It is hard to imagine that at any point in history, truer words have been spoken in such blind ignorance and arrogance. His blood be on us and on our children. Everything that happened in the Old Testament, the blood of the goats and the lambs, purifying, making what had been defiled once more holy, fulfilled in Christ, his blood be on us and on our children, making them holy. He wasn't just a sacrifice, he was the high priest as well. A couple of points, some of them very brief off of this. The first one is that faith is built progressively. Maybe some people have maybe walked with Christ for a long time, others not so long. God starts out like this is one day in seven. Can you set aside one day in seven? It doesn't take a huge amount of faith to do that. And what can really go wrong in one day? One day in seven. And then one year in seven. You can eat whatever the field produces by itself, but you can't actually work it. One year in seven. It's a slightly bigger step. And then every 49 years, you produce, you take nothing off of your fields. Can you do that? This faith is built progressively. It takes small steps. God starts working with us, and by His grace, slowly but surely, we start stretching that thing, trusting God for greater and greater miracles, greater and greater provision. Secondly, you cannot violate God's ways forever without consequence. Leviticus chapter 26, Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths, as long as it lies desolate, while you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall have rest. The rest that it did not have on your Sabbaths when you were dwelling in it. Now, although this was the law that God put down, these Sabbaths, there's no evidence anywhere else that the Jewish people, the Israelites, ever actually practiced it. They disregarded it. The land was never returned to the people that it had originally been allocated to. They never like, had the land rest. They plowed it seven out of seven years. You read the commentaries, they were in the land for 490 years before they were exiled off to Babylon. Commentators point out that there were 70 Sabbaths that should have taken place in those 490 years. And what was the length of time that they were exiled in Babylon for? 70 years. Now God in his incredible grace, so that's one missed Sabbath, two missed Sabbaths, three, four, he eventually gets up to 70 and it seems like he's never ever 490 years later, never going to take action for the injustice against the land, but at some point, God's patience and his grace runs out with his people. He says, 70 years you've deprived this land. 70 years you're going to your enemy's land so it can rest. You cannot violate God's ways forever without eventually suffering the consequences. Thirdly, equality and poverty alleviation is a biblical principle. We hear equality spoken about all the time. I think particularly in a country like ours, but not only ours, around the world. Equality, equality, equality. Noble idea. Disastrous outcomes. We, we have so pursued equality here that we've legislated it. And you know what the result of all of this trying to rid ourselves of inequality has got us? If you talk to the economists, we are now the most unequal society on the globe. For all our efforts, that's what we've resulted in. And this is the problem with equality as society has tried to pursue this thing around the world, is that equality is sought at the expense of those who produce. Wealth is seen as a zero-sum kind of thing. The reason some people don't have is because other people have too much. Some people grab too much of the power and only left a little sliver for others. So we've got to take some of their power and hand it over. That's how we try and deal with inequality here on this earth. And the result is disastrous around the world. We've just perfected it, I think. But it's disastrous around the world. And when I look at the mechanism that God gives you in Scripture, I don't know how we get back to it, but when I look at the mechanism that God put in place, I think to myself how different society would look if we had done this 
It's incredible because there was a poverty alleviation and there was equality that was done, but not at the expense of those who produce. You say, well, the farmer, at the jubilee, he lost the lands that he had acquired. Yeah, well, sort of. He acquired those lands, understanding that he would only have them for X number of years, and he paid accordingly. If I offer you land that you can use for five years versus land that you can use in perpetuity forever, you're going to be prepared to pay two very different prices for that land. And everyone, in theory, it was never practiced, but in theory, understood that there's so many years to the Jubilee, I'm going to get so many crops off of it, this land doesn't belong to me, it belongs to God. I want to pay for the number of crops that I can get off here. That's fair. And at the end of that period of time, there was nothing to stop that farmer from releasing the land from the person who had originally acquired it. But this is what it did for the person who had lost the land. If he had lost it, in the sense of not chosen voluntarily to lease it out, but he had found himself in debt or in trouble, and he, and he was forced to sell the land against his will, but in order to settle a debt. What it did in restoring the land to that person, the rights to do with it as he pleased, is it restored his dignity, restored a sense of value. It restored to him equality of opportunity, the opportunity to have a second crack at this thing. Maybe I made some big mistakes farming the first time. Second time around, I've learned I've got a second crack at this. It's not one mistake, one big mistake, and that's it. I will pay and my descendants will pay for many, many generations. It would be restored to that person. It was up to him then to either work the land himself or otherwise from a position of dignity to lease it out to someone who's better at farming for him to use his time and his skills elsewhere in the market or wherever it might have been. And where we've gone wrong in society is that we've abandoned this thing. The land belongs to the Lord. There's a whole bunch of people around the world and in this country, I know this is a political hot potato, who bought land with this understanding. I get to use it forever. Pass it on to whoever I want to pass it on to. And if you suddenly shorten that, you say, no, well, actually, not yours anymore. You've committed an injustice. And committing an injustice now to fix an injustice back then doesn't solve your problem. It compounds it. Because you now have a second group of people who've had an injustice committed against them. Now you've got two groups of people fighting about it. And maybe there's someone here smart enough to work out how we get back to it. But imagine if we had honored this thing God's way. The land belongs to him. What you produce in it belongs to you. But the land belongs to him. You get to use it for a specified period of time. Before it goes back to the person who God allotted it to. We'll probably never get back to that system, legally. But there's some principles here that you and I can pull out at every level of our economy and in life. This is what it says. You read the whole passage of Scripture, which we won't. When, it, when a man falls into poverty, this is what it says. If a brother becomes poor, don't lend money with interest. Don't sell food for profit. Don't enslave him. Give him the opportunity to redeem himself and his ability to earn. And there's principles in there. Irrespective of what, what the land thing is, how the economy runs, there are principles in there for you and I as believers. When we see someone who's fallen into a ditch, we either can help them out or we actually make the situation even worse. I'm waiting for time. I'll leave it there. <laughs> Leviticus 25 and verse 9. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land. And you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all of its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. Every 50 years you had this incredible coinciding of these two big moments in the life of the Israelite nation. Every single year, there was this Day of Atonement. And every 50 years, on the same day, the Day of Atonement, as well as the Year of Jubilee, described as the great and dreadful 
day of the year of the Lord. Great and dreadful. Great because it was a year of Jubilee. There was celebration. Dreadful because there was this dealing with a sin issue. And put yourself in the position of someone who through whatever circumstances had lost his land, been allotted to him originally, you'd been enslaved, separated from your family, limited freedoms, limited rights. Put yourself in the position of someone who on that day, he has sounded across the land a loud trumpet saying you are free to go back to your inheritance. Restoration of your inheritance, a restoration of your dignity, a restoration of relationships being severed as a result of this, a restoration of your sense of worth, your ability to produce, to do something productive. That is what happened every 50th year, this loud trumpet sound. And the incredible thing is for every single one of us, we might not have a trumpet sound that goes out across the land, but these two things still coincide for every single one of us on the day that we come to Christ. There is a reckoning for our sin and the incredible blessing that the truth in Scripture, that thing is removed far, far from our sight. And more than just the removal of our sin, there is a restoration of everything that has been lost at every level of our being. Emotionally, physically, spiritually, most important. A restoration of everything that was broken, everything that was lost. Freedom for the captives. I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind standing. Maybe the band can join me up in the front here. If you're here this morning and that day of atonement and that day of jubilee have never coincided for you. There's only one person who can do it, and that's Christ. We've, because of time, have just skimmed across some of the, some of the details of Leviticus. I encourage you to go study it. One of the things that the high priest that I mentioned earlier was that everything that had to be done was done by him alone. Everybody else stood at a distance and they watched. And it feeds right through into the New Testament. The work that Christ did on the cross. There's some striking, resen- or striking correlations there. Everything he did, he did by himself. And it's important that it was like that because we 2,000 years later can look back and it wasn't Jesus and a bunch of his disciples who were crucified. And we're such unsure as to exactly who did the work and who didn't. It was Jesus and him alone. He did all of the work as the priest and as the sacrifice. Everything that was done, he did by himself. An incredible amount of work. Much more than 15 animals and a bunch of firewood. For every single person who's ever put their faith in God, these two days, the Day of Atonement and the Day of Jubilee, have at some point coincided. I've come to understand my sin has been dealt with and I've been set free. There's been a restoration of everything that was lost as a result of the fall. And if you're here this morning and you've never experienced that, you've never experienced the overwhelming joy of having that weight lifted off of you and knowing more than that just the weight has been lifted off you, but actually there's been a restoration. I'd love love to walk you down that path this morning introduce you to Christ the high priest who did everything on our behalf while we watched at a distance if that's you this morning I'm going to ask you in a few moments to shoot your hand up some pastors up in the front will come pray with you or someone will come pray with you is anyone like that I'm going to give you a few moments anyone like that needs to respond this morning
Father, we thank you that we stand probably more blessed than any generation that's gone before us. Father, for many generations, your people were given instructions and they only understood in part what they were doing. And how your instructions must have seemed so arbitrary. All of the fine details that you required for a people to live in your holy presence. And yet, Lord, we stand today understanding the full work of Christ, understanding the fullness of your promises, the significance of everything that was done. And Lord, I pray that you just absolutely blow our minds and the revelation we have of your wisdom and the length that you've gone to to reach us. The incredible details that we get to stand this side of Christ's ministry death, his resurrection look back and say all of these little things there's just no ways that this can be coincidence down to the finest details every single thread begun in the Old Testament finished in the New Testament God where our faith needs strengthening Lord may that do it your word just the intricate wisdom of everything that you've done May we stand in absolute awe at your goodness. Father, we thank you once more for the work that Christ did. That he's our Sabbath, our Sabbath day, our Sabbath year, our jubilee, our atonement. And that, Father, at a level these people in Leviticus never understood we understand today that we stand free spiritually eternally we have restored to us an inheritance that goes far beyond a plot of land in a semi-desert we have restored far more than just relationships here on this earth but relationships with our heavenly father father may we just stand in the absolute wonder we would be considered beneficiaries of such a great blessing. Amen. An incredible message by Tim this morning. Why don't we encourage him? going to worship in a moment. I just felt that Tim's message was speaking about restoration and he prayed but maybe you're going through something this morning and you'd love for us to stand. We'd love to stand with you in prayer. So if you need any special prayer request this morning please don't hesitate to come forward. Thanks. Let's worship.